Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Princeton Adult School program of Uncover the Hidden Job Market. And uh, this program is very relevant just because of what it says right there on the opening slide. Uh, this was uh, some research in Forbes magazine, a business magazine, just a few years ago, that up to 70% of open jobs, jobs that they're looking to hire people for, up to 70% of open jobs are not posted, which means if you are primarily doing your job search online, then you are only seeing up to 30% of the open jobs. So what we're hoping to do is show you ways to find many more of those that are in the 70% that are not quite posted. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And remember, anytime that you do have a question, uh, just please uh, open your mic and uh, just interrupt and we will get to that right away. <clears throat> so I do want to just quickly introduce myself. I do know a couple of you, but not maybe not everybody. So that's me, David Shuckman, and I'm a information technology consultant. That's my company, Princeton Technology Advisors. I'm based in Princeton, New Jersey. And um, I'm also an active blogger. And actually I should say for full disclosure, I'm an inactive blogger. I've kind of put it aside for a little while, but I'm sure I will get back to it. And that's uh, my blog site, which is actually a page on my website. And um, uh, I am a leader in the job seeker support I call it Job Seeker Support Community because it is a, a gathering, a community of people. And I lead a group in Princeton called PSG or Professional Service Group of Mercer County, which does meet every Friday morning, now virtually, Friday at 10 o'clock. And so you are welcome to attend tomorrow morning or any Friday. You can just check out the event calendar with the connection info at psgofmercercounty.org psg of mercercounty.org so it's free no need to pre-register just go find the link on the website and attend when you want and uh, tomorrow we will be talking about linkedin and we have a presenter who is uh, very knowledgeable about the insides and workings of linkedin so she will not only teach us how to use it but how linkedin internally thinks and functions and then three other groups where I'm active. Uh, I co-facilitate at New Jersey Job Seekers, and I'm on the boards of the um, Career Support Group at St. Gregor the Great and the Breakfast Club of New Jersey, all groups that are based in central New Jersey. So when we think about the hidden job market, I guess we should define it first. And what is the hidden job market? And so really very simply, the hidden job market is positions that are available but the employer hasn't advertised them that's simply what it is so these are positions that are open available they're likely recruiting or open to recruiting but they're just not making it of advertisements in the very obvious places and so when you think about where the advertised job market where we typically more easily see positions that may be open and available um, there are a lot of places that are out there so of course, there are the job boards, and the job boards might be like Indeed.com or um, ZipRecruiter, um, Dice, Career Builder, and others. And you definitely should be on the job boards. Uh, post your resume, post your profile, because recruiters do use job boards to look for people. A trick with the job boards or, and a, a recommendation I have is that you want to keep your job board posting as active and current as possible because what we know about job boards the way they work is the recruiter does put in some sort of search term you know project manager central new jersey or whatever search term they're doing the job boards will return results that it matches uh, the profiles of people to the to the request among the criteria that the job boards use they also want to make sure that the resume, the profile are fairly current. They don't want to serve up old profiles. They want to serve up current ones. So here's a tip to keep your profiles current on each of the job boards. Uh, and this is what I used to do. Every week, I used to log on to the job board, and I was on well, probably four or five of them. And I would update my profile. The piece of information I would update was fairly irrelevant, but just make a small change and save it. 
For instance, maybe you change your phone number. Now, I'm not saying you have to have lots of phones and change your phone number. Change the format. So if your area code is 609, instead of having parentheses, change it to 609 dash your number. Next week, change it to 609 dot and your number. Just switch back and forth or use parentheses or don't use parentheses. Each week, make a small change. And that tells those job boards that you are current and active. The other thing I used to do was every week, I uploaded a new copy of my resume. I actually had two copies of my resume. I called it David Shuckman 1 and David Shuckman 2. They were carbon copies except for the name of the file. And what I would do is if I, I would do this on a Sunday, if the Sunday coming that I was doing this for was an even day, I would remove the resume that I had posted and I would upload David Shuckman 2. If it's an even day, I uploaded David Shuckman 2. A week later, seven days later, it would be an odd day. So instead of being uh, the second, it would be, let's say, the ninth. And I would remove the David Shuckman 2 and upload the David Shuckman 1. So my resume was always current, no more than a week old. So do that. It'll improve your chances of being found by recruiters using job boards. Another place where jobs are advertised, company career pages. Companies do spend a lot of time on their website to make sure that they're providing very useful information. And they do know that people who have a list of companies that they're targeting will look at the career pages. So look at the company career pages. They're likely to post positions that they have open. Another place are the classified ads. Not quite as common as they used to be. I can certainly remember years ago when the Sunday classified section in the New York Times was very big and I would think other papers, city papers as well. Now, not so much because uh, they do put a lot of that information online and they rely on online services, but that is more of the traditional, traditional advertised job market. Another place is job fairs. Job fairs, of course, during COVID are not really in person anymore. There are some virtual ones, but job fairs are a great place to not only learn about open positions, but maybe meet some of the HR people who are in the organization. And that really should be your goal at a job fair. Your goal at a job fair should not be that you're gonna get a job. Typically job fairs, there's a lot of competition and they tend to be the more uh, entry level or junior type of positions. Not that you're not seeking those, but that's typically what they are. And, uh, but, they usually have one or two people from the HR department. And I would say what you'll use a job fair for is make that connection, introduce yourself, exchange your business card. You may even drop off a resume. But the reason why is now that you've met someone in HR, a few weeks or months later, you may find a position on the company's uh, career page. Now you can contact that HR person directly and bypass the computer system, the online application system. So use job fairs for that. Another place for the advertised job market, traditional job market, are recruiters. Recruiters are the people, if they're external, if they work for a recruiting company, some people call them headhunters. What they do is uh, they have clients who are the companies with the positions, and they're looking for candidates to fill those positions. And so those would be the agency recruiters or the external recruiters. Of course, the company will have their internal recruiters in HR as well, but from uh, the the perspective we're talking now, we're really talking about the agency or external recruiters. Another place could be professional associations or trade associations. Member companies will often post their open positions within the tra uh, trade association because they know there are people within the industry that belong to the association. And a lot of times the associations do allow for job postings. So you may be able to find some positions there as well. And also social media sites. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, lots of the social media sites, companies more and more are using them to post positions or at least post links to go to their company career pages and use the social media sites as advertisements. And the reason why companies are doing that more and more is they know that people like us will be on some of these social media sites, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or any of the other social media sites that are out there. Now, we're not gonna at all deep dive into using social media, so but be aware that you do want to have 
presence and profile in some of these so you can uh, cull through the information on the companies of interest. So when you think about how hiring managers like to hire, I don't know if anyone on this call has been a hiring manager, <clears throat> but one reason why positions are hidden is because of the way hiring managers prefer to hire. Now, I was a hiring manager in my career uh, for well, the, probably a better part of 14, 15 years. And one of the things I did not like in my job was having to hire people. I liked having people. I liked people getting the work done. But I didn't like the process of hiring people, but I did it anyway. So I preferred, and most hiring managers would prefer, when they have an open position, they want to contact the people that they know and trust. They're going to contact people within their network, and they'll reach out. So if there's an open position, they might call a few people that they know, whether from trade associations or former jobs or whatever it is, and reach out to them right away. And so when they're reaching out to people, they're not posting the position out to the public, they're reaching out to people. This doesn't always pan out. A lot of times when a hiring manager reaches out to people they know, those people are not looking to change jobs, but that's okay. So the next place that they like to look is asking for referrals from the people they know and trust. So if I were going to reach out to a former coworker and ask if they'd like to come back and work for me in my new company, they may say no, and that's fine. But I may ask them, do you know anybody that may be job hunting? Or do you know anybody that's interested in making a move? Because now I'm getting kind of a qualified lead and it's really a lot easier, it's more reliable for me than if I'm going out into the open market. So hiring managers, when they can't hire people that they absolutely know, uh, they ask the people that they know for references. And the last thing we like to do as hiring managers is hire strangers, going through the whole recruitment process, getting to know people, trying to understand that they are truly qualified, if they meet the needs that we have based on what they're projecting on their resume and what their career has been in the past. So it's a lot more effort to hire strangers. So hiring strangers is really at the point when positions begin to have the opportunity to be promoted and uh, shown in the public eye. Um, otherwise, they may be hidden. So jobs can be hidden for many, many reasons. So about 30% of jobs that are open are published, which means 70% aren't. Hence the analogy of that iceberg picture on the right side. When you look at an iceberg, you're actually looking at only about 10% of its actual mass about 90% of the mass is below the water level. And if you've never seen an iceberg, you've probably seen an ice cube in a glass of uh, soda or water or some drink. Only the top portion of the ice cube is above, most of it is below the water. And it's the same with the hidden job markets. So why are jobs hidden? Well, for one thing, the hiring manager could be waiting for final approval. This is something that always boggled me. And even when I had teams that uh, reported to me. Whenever someone left the organization, I now needed permission to fill that role that we had a person anyway. It was in our budget, but I always had to ask permission or get final approval. The company sometimes would make uh, a, a decision process to see, can I, can I get along with one less person? And they could say, a little bit of money, the salary and the benefits. So often what happens is the hiring manager knows that there's a position, but can't really post it yet because waiting for internal approval from the organization. The hiring manager could also be looking at their own network, the people that they know. So they have a position, there's a seat open, there's a desk with nobody sitting there, and then they're looking internally, reaching out to the people that they've used to work with in the past, other people they know from professional associations, their own internal network. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's just easier. It's more reliable in a lot of times. So the position's available, but it's not published for that reason. They're looking at their own network. Sometimes recruiters know about a position, but they're waiting for the company to say, go out and hire. Now, this was something that I would do once in a while when I would work with recruiters. It's very common practice. I have a job description and I know exactly 
the job description for this new role. And I contact the recruiters that we work with, the external recruiters, the agency recruiters, and I let them know I have a position that's available, but we're waiting for final permission. So the recruiter has the position. And sometimes what happens is the recruiter starts recruiting for the position. But when they do, they can never mention the name of the company or anything that alludes to the company, maybe not even the industry, until me as the hiring manager will say, okay, recruiter, you can now recruit. And the reason why recruiters get the positions ahead of time, even when they're not officially open, because they're going to go and start to find candidates right away. The reason why is as soon as the hiring manager contacts the recruiter and says, it's okay, the recruiters can send resumes quite quickly that way. HR sometimes is looking internally. When the organization is medium or large size, then what can happen is HR could be looking to see if there might be an internal transfer. And so that's very common as well, to see if someone might transfer from another department or another role into the position. So it's not being posted at all until the company internally figures out if they're going to fill it. Now, Ultimately, there'll, there'll be a position that remains unfilled. So if I had an open position and someone transferred from another department, it's possible somebody in the other department um, has a position available. May not be the exact position as mine, but uh, it often does leave a position open. Um, maybe there's an upcoming retirement. So here we are in April. Imagine if uh, someone came to me as the manager and said, David, I've had a long career. I'm retiring at the end of the year, giving a lot of notice. It doesn't always happen that you get that much notice, but some sort of advanced notice. So it's possible that um, an upcoming retirement is known internally. The hiring manager, people in the organization may know about it, and uh, but it's not published yet, and the position's not published until they get closer to when that person may leave. And in addition to actually retirement, there can be other life events. So maybe someone, a woman who would take maternity leave and that would require an opening. So not uncommon for when someone does take a maternity leave, they may be out for several weeks or months. And so we they may wanna fill the position uh, when it gets closer to the person taking their leave. HR has other priorities now. Now, when I teach this presentation in person, I would ask the question, what other priorities might HR have besides hiring people? And usually half the room shouts, they fire people. Well, no, that's not quite what I was thinking. Um, but HR as a department could be doing other things depending on the time of year. If it's the middle of the year, they may be getting prepared for um, goal setting or other agenda items within the company to help manage people's performance. If it's near the end of the year, they could be doing uh, bonus allocation or performance reviews and things like that. Uh, some departments in HR may also be doing negotiating next year's insurance costs and other benefits. So they typically have other projects and they may not be able to put the time into uh, publishing a position. But are those jobs really hidden? And that's the question. And uh, I'm going to show you ways that may help you uncover some of them and put more uh, exposure for you to those positions. So for one thing, you need to get to start getting to know more people. So I'm going to show you there may be up to 20 people in an organization that may know about a position. Now, clearly, it depends on the size of the organization. Big organizations have more people, so more people may know about a position as it becomes available. Um, other companies may be a little smaller, a little bit tight, more tight-knit. There'll be fewer people potentially than a larger organization. But certainly we'll look at the types of people that are going to know about, potentially know about a position that's open in the company, even if they haven't published it yet. And so one is the hiring manager. So at the very least, the hiring manager knows that he or she has someone that's left the organization or the organization is growing, and they are going to be hiring people or a person fairly soon. So the hiring manager, if you could know the, the hiring manager in a company, uh, you may be exposed to positions a little bit sooner. Remember, that hiring manager doesn't want to go out to the public. They would like to be able to go uh, and contact people that they know. 
So as you start meeting more people or putting yourself in a position to meet more people, the hiring manager or people who are hiring managers at companies are people that you will want to meet. Other people that are going to know the department manager. So clearly the boss of the department is going to know that uh, some somebody has left his department or her department. And so that's very possible. So because the hiring manager has already let the department manager know somebody has left. So if you can find people that are in the more middle to senior management of organizations and uh, get to know them a little bit. And we'll talk about how you get to meet and know people shortly. And then if it's a big enough company, they have like a company leadership or division leadership. And they could be different sizes. It could be three, six, more people. I pick six. And so it's possible that the senior management of the company knows that there are some openings in the organization. Now, the higher up the, the chain you go from hiring manager to department manager, department manager to company leadership, the less likely is that the higher people in the organization know a lot of the details about a job. But if you know somebody like that, they'll say, yeah, I know there's a job in accounting, or I know there's a job in an IT department. That's about all they'll know, but it's good that they'll know that. They can alert you. So who else may know in a company? The HR director, there's usually somebody in, in the human resources that's kind of responsible for internal recruiting and hiring people. And so the HR director, if it's a big enough company, they'll have an HR director and an HR staff. And so um, the HR director is going to know that a position available. The HR director may not know a lot of details about the position, but they will know the positions available. And then I always get the uh, boos and moans when I say, well, the HR director doesn't really do a lot of work. The HR directors obviously do a lot of work, but they usually assign that then to the HR generalist, the person who's uh, uh, working for the HR department and may be segregated between um, recruiting and hiring and on the other side, benefits and administration. So now there'll be at least one of the recruiters in the company who may know about the position. And so far, there are 10 people in this company that know about this one position. Who else are going to know? Well, typically in a department, there are staff. So the coworkers, the coworkers are going to know about the position because they used to have somebody in the company, someone they talked to in the break room or saw at meetings, uh, team meetings, and who's not there any longer. So the coworkers are going to know. And what's nice about the coworkers, they're likely going to know a lot about the details of the type of work the position is. So if you meet people that are the worker bees and the, and the coworkers and not the management, you'll get a lot of good information about the nature of any position that may be available. And then very often what happens is any job that we do is not an island by itself. It's not set aside. You often are working with people in other departments. Maybe you're receiving work from one department, and when you complete your work, you give it off to another department. So there could be dependent departments as well. And if there's another five people, there could be 20 or more people that know that there's one position available in that one department for that hiring manager. And so it really shows that you need to know more people. It doesn't mean you have to know 20 people, but if you know one person in the companies of interest, then that could be a good benefit for you, an incredible benefit. Of course, if you can learn no two or three or four. And the reason why I'm showing you these different roles is to demonstrate that there are lots of people in any organization that can know about a position. So therefore, you can get to know just about anybody in a company to find out if there's a position. Now, this is going to come back later when we talk a little bit about internal referrals. So how do you get to know more people? Well, networking. Networking is really the way to do it. You need to go out and more actively meet and get to know and get introduced to more people. And uh, hopefully they get to know you as well. And so this is really, I had read this not long ago, this is really a good definition or kind of description of what the goal or the meaning of professional networking is. It's the exchange of information among individuals specifically to cultivate productive relationships. You are not networking to get a job. You are networking to meet people. The job will be there and the people may be able to connect you to the job. 
So the goal is not to network to get a job, but to just meet more people. And these people don't have to be your best friends. They just need to be professional associates. Okay. So it's a means of connecting with people and it's anybody, anybody in the organization. And actually from the anyone, it could be you have a friend that you have, turns out that his or her spouse works at a company. It could be anybody. It could be someone on the supermarket line. It could be anybody it could be that connection. It doesn't have to only be people within an organization. And what you want to do is you want to stay in touch with these people periodically. You don't have to be stalking. This is actually kind of a joke. There's a fine line between networking and stalking. But you do have to be in touch every once in a while. And it may just be sending an email saying, hey, how you doing? Or sending an email that says, hey, I saw this article and I thought of you. Little things like that. That's all you have to do to keep you in the back of their mind. So networking is not about who you know. And the best result is it's about who knows you. You may say you know the president of some company that you're interested in, and that's fine. You may have met this person, and now you know him or her. But are they going to think of you when something comes up that should trigger them to think of you? So you have to maintain and build that relationship, that productive relationship. So when they have a situation in their office, they begin to think about you as one of those people they will want to contact. And it's about building strong relationships. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that's true, and here's why. It's in bold red. And I wouldn't put it in bold red if it wasn't true. And I think I read it on the internet. And if I read it on the internet, it must be true, right? Oh, here we are. So we have a bit of an intermission point. Nobody has uh, raised their hand or interrupted just yet. How are you guys doing? Any questions so far? Comments? Thoughts? Actually, I see there's a, something in chat. How do we do that with COVID and people are working from home? So that's from Linda. So Linda, you're asking about networking, how you do it networking from home is linda still on the call yes i am okay is that is that the meaning of your question yes yes oh. you know what's people funny is the buildings now you know pardon me? people are not in their bill in their buildings they're at home working oh, that's right so you know the, the buildings are kind of irrelevant and here's why when you're trying to meet people at these companies of interest, you're not in their building anyway. You're already remote from them. You're not connected to them. So networking and meeting people and connecting people with people, it's, it's not always an in-person activity. So the fact that we are in COVID or a lockdown or offices have gone to a remote environment really hasn't changed the dynamic very much. So uh, you might find a position of interest and you might find somebody that you'd like to meet or connect with. You can send them an email, might be one way of doing it. We're gonna talk more about that a little later. So, but that may be one way to do it. Another way might be if you use LinkedIn and you see there's a, pers a person that you wanna uh, connect with and you're not connected to them on LinkedIn, see if there's somebody that's connected to you and connected to that person. And LinkedIn, that's called a second degree connection. And the reason why that's powerful is you can connect. So let's say you want to connect to somebody who's connected to me. You and you and assuming you and I are connected, you would send me a note in LinkedIn or an email. Hey David, can you connect me with this person? And I could tell you personally, I would be happy to. I would tell you if I have a, a strong connection or a weak connection to that person, but I would be happy to do that. And then I would introduce you by email or by LinkedIn in LinkedIn. And when that person receives a, a message from me introducing Linda to him or her, they're likely to open that email. It tends to be very effective. Yeah. Or there are a lot of virtual groups. So a lot of groups that used to meet in person are now meeting virtually. You may be able to have an offline chat with any of them as well. Was that helpful? Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes, I am in LinkedIn, indeed. Um, uh, yeah, all the, there's a lot of jobs out there. <laughs> you know, there are, yeah, it has opened up quite a bit. Companies more and more have become comfortable with the remote office uh, workforce. Uh, a year ago, uh, companies were probably not comfortable with it, almost in a panic, but they knew they had to make it work, and they have. And I think it's going to be a bit more of our new normal. It's going to be a larger uh, out-of-the-office workforce. Definitely. It makes sense. Why why pay money for rent or a mortgage on a big building? Sure, sure. Yeah. There'll be big That's savings. Great, great savings, yeah. Or maybe what they'll do is they'll have less office space, shared office location, because they know their staff individually may only come in one or two days a week. They won't be there full time, so people can share a desk and a computer when they need to work in the office compared to working from outside the office. So yeah, companies gonna be making big shifts. Um, I'm not an investment advisor, but you may wanna, if you've got a real estate in your portfolio, you may look, Speak to your financial professional and see if it makes sense to keep that. Companies are going to change. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns? And there'll be other places. Um, I have another intermission point, I think, as well. Of course, we'll have time at the end. But any other questions right now? Okay, well, we will push along. And anytime you have a question, like I said, uh, feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and let us know, and we will move forward with that. So we will open up the curtains again, and we will continue. So why even bother networking to find the job? There is a published job market. Of course, it's only about 30% uh, give or take of the published jobs. Jobs are there. But why network? Well, here's a study from the University of Michigan from just a couple of years ago. Your odds of getting a job through a job site application is one in 250. So if you find a job and it says click here to apply using one of those job site applications or applicant tracking systems, your odds statistically are one in 250. Those are terrible odds. Uh, I would not go to Atlantic City and play a table that had odds like that. Uh, it's just too, too, too much stacked against you. And while there are some techniques possibly to improve those a little when only applying in the job, the applicant tracking system, this is the statistical average. So very poor jobs uh, statistics. However, employee referrals, in other words, you reaching out to an employee of the company, only make up 7% of applicants, but 40% of hires. 40% of hires, new hires, come from internal referrals. So what that's basically telling you is there's not a lot of competition in the space of employee referrals. So get to meet and know some employees. But there's a very good chance that you'll get hired that way. Certainly, you can get hired more quickly. Oops, wrong way, sorry. So you want to begin to network with people that currently work within your the companies of interest. And your companies of interest, you may have a list of companies in your industry or in your field or that have the roles that you're in. Make that list of companies and then begin to identify people in those companies that you may be able to speak with and get to know a little bit. The other thing is when you speak with somebody at a company, ask them if they have an internal company referral policy. A lot of companies too. And they pay a very big bonus to their employee that recommended somebody to come to the company. So that's why um, you get 40% of hires um, and referrals, employees are very happy to contribute because they may have a financial gain at the end of the process. So keep this in mind. So what if you're nervous about networking? What if networking uh, is not is just something that's very hard to do, you're not comfortable to do it? Well, networking isn't about getting rid of your nerves. If you're a little nervous about networking, uh, if you're a little bit anxious, um, networking isn't gonna stop that from happening. But what you can do, hopefully, is redirect 
that anxiety, if you have any of that, into maybe a little bit of a kind of excitement. So maybe what you do, if you're going to go to a networking event once we're in person again, or if you're going to log on to a meeting, a virtual meeting or a meetup group, just before you connect to the group, before you walk in the room, take a few minutes to kind of center yourself, prepare yourself, calm yourself down, psych yourself up, do what's necessary to get yourself into that moment a bit more comfortably. And so it will minimize some of the anxiety if that's something you are indeed feeling. Also, begin to rationalize it for yourself. Why are these people important to me? These people are important to me because they can be connections. Someone can be a connection to my very next job. So really what you're going to do is the end game where you're trying to get to of getting an interview and meeting someone that way will be more important and override any anxiety that you may have. And so think of it that way. And also, you may sometimes visualize the entire session. What's it going to be like when I walk in the door? What are the things that I want to do that are going to go well? What are some of the things that may not go well and I'll have to just uh, avoid them? What do I want to accomplish? I want to meet three people. There could be 100 people in the room. You don't have to meet 100 people. Set a realistic goal. I want to get to meet three people. And what's the best case scenario? I'll get a business card. I'll get a contact. I'll get an invitation to have a, a, a phone call sometime next week. And so that would be terrific. Those are great things that will be as a result of networking. And then if you need to, um, maybe before you uh, connect to that meeting, that virtual meeting, or if you're going on location before you maybe get out of your car or walk into the room, maybe uh, sing a song to yourself or listen to some music from your phone or your iPad and um, something that will make you feel good and make you relax a little bit. So if you're a little bit of a nervous person, if you get a little bit of anxiety about networking, these are some things that you may be able to do that could be helpful to you. Um, these are things that several people have told me over the years that they found very, very helpful. But what if you're an introvert? So people say, I'm an introvert. I can't network. Well, when you're an introvert, you tend to be... Uh, well, not as interested in being in large groups, but it's not because you hate people. You don't hate people. You like people. But it could be whatever it is, a little bit of shy, or you don't know how to start a conversation, a little unsure of yourself. But you know what? Networking is perfect for introverts. Matter of fact, it's really probably one of the best things you can do as an introvert. It sounds counterintuitive, but here's why. Introverts don't like big crowds. So if you're an introvert, you're not likely to stand up in the front of a room to talk to a lot of people. But networking, as it turns out, is really an activity that's best as a one-on-one -on -one activity, just you and the person that you're talking to. And you don't need to spend a lot of time talking to that person. Five minutes, 10 minutes to get started is all the time that you need to be successful. So networking does work best as a one-on-one -on -one activity. Introverts tend to be quiet, which is terrific because that makes you a good listener. The best way you can be effective in networking is not to just blabber and talk and tell people about you, but listen to what the other person is saying. And so introverts tend to be very good at that. You'll be a good listener. You'll take in what the other person is saying. In the end, you'll get a lot more valuable information than if you were the extrovert just talking to everyone else. Now, introverts don't like to talk about themselves. You tend to be uh, introspective and curious. So you can be a good helper. As being a good listener, as we talked about a moment ago, um, you'll also then in turn be a good helper because introverts tend to want to be helpful to people, especially as they begin to get comfortable in the conversation. So think about the people you are most willing to help. The type of people you are most willing to help are the people that have previously helped you. So here's your opportunity right from the beginning of helping others. And later on, when you reach out to them for connect you with a hiring manager or introduce you to somebody, they will return the favor in spades. Introverts tend to have a very close circle of friends. 
you know, you're not hanging around with lots of people and, and typically as an introvert, um, having the very large group of friends. Well, networking tends to work very well in small and effective work groups. So what you may do is form your own small work group, three or four people, and you'll, you'll meet periodically or have a discussion periodically, all to help you with your job search and help the others with their job search as well. So networking is perfect if you are an introvert. And you may not be able to tell because of the way I'm presenting right now. A lot of people tell me I am not an introvert, but I tend to get very shy in big groups. I tend to also be more of an introvert. Or as my friend Debbie Coat would say, she calls me an in-between vert. Okay, maybe that's what I am. But I, I tend not to be the most outward person either. So who should you network with? Who should you try to connect with to expand your professional network? Well, there are lots of different people, but when it's from professional only and people you haven't met yet, um, strategic partners. Um, these are professionals who are in complementary businesses, but they may share the same target market. So what do I mean by that? Maybe um, you are a project matter, manager in pharmaceutical. Um, you don't need to meet other project managers in pharmaceutical, in, uh, but what you may want to do is meet other people in the pharmaceutical in industry, whether it's IT people, accounting, finance, sales, marketing, doesn't matter. So these are complementary um, strategic partners. They could be um, complementary industries altogether. It could be that you're in the um, automotive industry, and then there's somebody that you meet who sells um, security systems for cars. And that's complementary to being in an automotive industry or dealership. So you wanna look for people that have the same market segment as you, but maybe slightly different um, business or role within that. You wanna find subject matter experts. You wanna find people who are in your professional area. And maybe they know more than you, or they have more experience than you. People you can share ideas with, people that can help you grow a little so you can learn something new. It's not that you're so far behind them. Um, you're still a great person to network with. They'll get value from meeting with you as well. Remember, you're gonna be helpful to them, but you're gonna find other people in your area that know a lot about your industry They'll, find, they'll be able to provide a lot of information to you, and they may have a lot of connections as well. And also your own current network, people that you are already connected with. Those people can help you. They can strengthen. So what you want to do is strengthen and leverage your existing relationships. These may be people that you worked with a few years ago, one or two jobs ago. Reach out to them again. Let Invite them to talk with you. And uh, they can be um, people that you just haven't been in touch with. They could be customers of yours uh, that you've had before. Yep. So there are different types of networking, and we'll really touch on them. I'm not going to deep dive into a lot. We are going to deep dive into one, uh, which is called the informational interview. But one type of uh, networking is just one-on-one, -on -one, and here are ways to initiate them. You might send somebody an email. You might pick up the phone and call them or maybe uh, ask for a virtual session. Let's have a Zoom meeting together. Uh, you can offer to meet with them in person. Uh, you may want to be careful if you are not quite prepared to be uh, uh, close in their circle right now. You may need to social distance, um, but you can certainly meet with someone across a table. Um, and then you'll also want to have what's called the informational interview. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment, which is a very powerful technique, certainly. So one-on-one -on -one networking, and these tend for a lot of people to be very easy to do because it's just one person and another person, not overwhelming, not scary for some people. Visiting groups. There are job seeker support groups, people that um, are also in job search right now, and uh, we get together to help uh, support each other in different ways. Meetup.com, the meetup groups are great places to meet lots of people, and they don't have to be people just within your industry. Um, they may be, like I mentioned before, complementary people. 
So if you are an accountant, well, you certainly can join a meetup group or any professional association with accountants in it. But in one sense, they may all be your competition. So maybe what you want to do is join an industry meetup group or an industry of interest, and you'll meet people throughout the industry, and they may be able to connect you when there's an accounting position in their company. So you're not having as many comp competition or many competitors because you're not in a group of only accountants, but you're in an industry. And that's why the benefit of professional associations as well, if it's industry professional associations. You can for form your own work group, similar to what I mentioned before. Two, three, four of you can get together and maybe meet every other week. Um, you might say on the first and the 15th of the month or the first and third Saturday of the month and have a, a meeting. It might be virtual or in person and kind of work through together and strategize, um, talk about challenges, talk about successes. You have a lot of success with a group like that. Social media. Social media is incredibly powerful for connecting with people. For job search, LinkedIn is the largest uh, professional networking site that is out there. It is not the largest social media site. Facebook is the largest social media site on the planet. Uh, LinkedIn tends to be very business oriented. And so that's why it's very effective. Also, LinkedIn has a very powerful job search tool for the recruiters to use. They have recruiters actually use a separate system, not the one you and I would use. It's called LinkedIn Recruiter that has much stronger search capabilities. So um, you want to be on LinkedIn and recruiters are using LinkedIn more than most of the other job boards because LinkedIn is more cost effective for them than the subscriptions of other jobs uh, boards. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, companies are more and more advertising and promoting on these sites. The reason why is their customers are there. And because the customers are there, these become great places for them to promote and advertise. And because the customers are there, they know job seekers are there. And so it's a great way for them to promote and advertise. So you should be there as well. So lots of social media sites. And there are lots of other organizations. There are volunteer organizations. Uh, they may be interested in meeting people that can help them in a volunteer capacity. Most organizations that have volunteers don't turn away volunteers. COVID may set limits on what they can do right now and put restrictions on how they accept volunteers, but that's great uh, for an option, volunteer organizations. Religious groups, great place to meet people. Uh, certainly you might have a like-minded interest, even if it's not religious from professional, but you will from um, a personal connection perspective. Chambers of Commerce, a great place where businesses aggregate. Family functions are great places to meet people. And you may chuckle a little, say, I know people in my family. That's true. But most people in their family don't know what everybody else in their family does. So you can now talk to your family and say, this is what I do. Do you know anybody? Can you put, point me in the right touch, in the right direction? They'll put me in touch with someone. The checkout lines of a supermarket or any place like that, or at the library, you can speak to the reference librarian. There are a lot of places we can get a lot of connections of very influential people. Oh, our next intermission point. Okay, how are you folks? Okay, you're still with me. That's good. Any questions at this point? Any curiosity? Something we should go back to and cover again? Okay. Well, it doesn't have to be right now, and that's fine. Uh, we will have time at the end. And remember, we are recording this program. I will make the presentation available probably by um, tomorrow, if not the tonight. Uh, I've got something I'm doing tonight. If I don't get to it tonight, it will be by tomorrow. Okay, let's see. Looks like there's a chat message from Neil. Where could someone find one of the job seeker support groups? Um, so, Neil, I'm assuming you're in New Jersey. So I'm going to put a link. I just put a link in chat, and it's called landingexpert.com. Landingexpert.com. So uh, this is the website of a career coach. His name is Alex Freund. He's also in central New Jersey. And he maintains this list 
of job seeker support and networking groups. So when you go to his website, there's a link. It's either called networking, networking list, networking group, something like that. It's a menu item. And when you go there, uh, a kind of a map opens up and you put in your zip code and how many miles you're willing to travel. So if you're in Princeton, you put 08540 and then you say, I don't know, I'm willing to travel 25 miles. Now you might as well put 100 miles because if not all, just about all these groups are still meeting virtually and geography is not as much of a barrier. So you can go to, if you're in South Jersey, you can join a group in North Jersey, doesn't matter at all. So that's a great place to do that. And um, tomorrow morning, PSG of Mercer County will be meeting. We meet uh, Fridays, every Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I put that link there as well. So we do meet once a week. We are listed in the landing expert site. And so if you'd like, uh, go to the website, psgofmercercounty.org, click on the event calendar and tomorrow morning's event, and you will see the link uh, same like this, go to meeting is what we use, and just join a few minutes before 10, and you can see a terrific presentation on LinkedIn. Um, strategic research-based approach to LinkedIn is what Lynn Williams is presenting tomorrow. So that's available too. Good. Any other questions? And remember, there will be time a little later as well. Give you just another moment in case you're typing. Okay, so let's move along. And we will move ourselves along there. The curtain is open. So I promised you I would talk about the informational interview, an incredibly wonderful and powerful tool and technique to have in your tool chest. So what is the informational interview? It's not a job interview. If it was, it, this would be called, what is a job interview? This is an informational interview. And basically it's a meeting, it's a conversation. Often they're informal or semi-formal. They tend not always to be very formal at all, but all it is is having a conversation with somebody. Now, typically it's job search related. It doesn't have to be, but that's in the context of what we're talking about here. What is your goal? What should you expect to get out of the informational interview? Well, and it doesn't matter. You could be talking to the hiring manager. You could be talking to somebody in HR for that conversation. You could be talking to someone who's one of the workers and not the hiring manager. It's anybody in, uh, in a, your profession. And you as the job seeker, you're looking to gain information about maybe the industry or the corporate culture. So you're interested in that kind of information of any potential workplace. You also could ask for advice on your career because the longer that you're out of work, there could be changes within the industry. So you may wanna ask what are some of the tools that are currently being used um, and or what's new in um, government regulations and different things about that. So you're asking for a little bit of guidance or advice or information about the industry. You certainly need to be current on the way the job is performed in order to be competitive in your job search. So that's what you, the job seeker, is trying to get out of it. Now, the other person, the employed professional, what they're looking to do is learn about other people that they can add to their network. So they're gonna enjoy speaking with you. They may judge your professional experience, your professional pro potential as uh, an employee, as someone who may fit within their corporate culture. Why are they doing that? Remember that the hiring manager doesn't want to go out to the public to fill a position. They want to stick within your, their network. This is a way for you to be part of that person's network. So the informational interview is never about hiring. It's never about a specific job. As a matter of fact, don't ask for a job. What you're going to just do is ask to have a few minutes of conversation. Now, is it about hiring? Is it about a job? Yeah, sure, it's always you know, under there. It's always kind of the underlying theme, but your outward discussion is not about a specific job that may be there and is not about hiring at this moment. 
So what do you do? How do you get that informational interview? What is a technique or some techniques that may work to be effective? And so I'll tell you what I found to be very effective. So when you have the informational interview, you're asking for these types of information. You're asking for advice on the company, the industry, information about the company and the industry, and also ask for more contacts. So before you end the conversation, whether it's in person or on the phone or Zoom or go to meeting, you'll thank the person say, is there anyone else you recommend I speak with? Just that simple. And they will hopefully connect you with someone else that would be a good resource for you. And when that happens, you've now just doubled your network within that organization or that industry. Don't ask for a job. You don't say, thank you very much for your time. Will you hire me now? No, never do that. Okay. So how might you initiate uh, the informational interview? So I found I ask someone that's connected to me and the other person. And so uh, I'll give an example. I had the opportunity to be connected with the chief information officer, the CIO of Subaru of America, the car company. Subaru of America, their main office is in uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, they use, at the time when I was more actively job hunting, they use technology that I used in my prior company. They're in the transportation industry, of course, automobile sales. And I came from another sector of the transportation industry. So I thought this would be a good person for me to connect with. If I had just reached out to this person blindly, him not knowing me, and is a gentleman, uh, was at the time, I don't know if he's still there, he might not have accepted my email, he might not have accepted my call. But what I did was I reached out to somebody that I saw that was connected to both me and that person. And it was a vendor of mine. So there was a software vendor that I had who was also a vendor of his. So I reached out to the software vendor who professionally I knew, I can call this person, and asked if he knew the other person. He said, yes, I'm on the phone with him about once a month. Would, and I asked, would you facilitate an introduction? And as we talked about it, what he actually suggested, which worked out well, is he said, you write an email to him, but use my name that I referred you. And that was all I needed to do. So I wrote to the person, his name was Robert. And I said, uh, Elliot suggested I introduce myself. And so that was the subject of the email. Elliot suggested that we get connected. He opened that email and he responded to me the same day. And he said, yes, I will put you in touch with my administrative assistant and we'll get a meeting together. It did take three weeks before we got the meeting, but it was a very productive meeting at the time. So that's what I did. And all I asked for was, may I have a few minutes of your time to learn a little bit more about the organization at Subaru? That's what I asked for. And I promised him just a few minutes. Now, what I did was um, I was on the phone. I had my watch. And periodically, I looked at my watch. Now, if you have a, a visual, like a Zoom meeting or something, you might not want to keep looking down at your watch. Keep maybe an alarm clock in front near your monitor. And then when you get close to maybe 15 minutes, let the person know, listen, I don't want to keep you much longer. You promised me a few minutes. I appreciate that. And so show that you're a person of your word. You're only keeping to those few minutes. If they turn around and say, oh, David, I've got plenty of time, something like that to you, great. You know you can have a lot more time. You might check in every 15 or 20 minutes how they're doing because, of course, they're working. But honor that 15 minutes. Now, another thing I used to do is if I ever met the person in person, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to doing that real soon, what I did was I set my alarm on my smartphone. And my smartphone is on my waist. I have a, a belt clip. And so if I knew my meeting was at 3 o'clock, I set my alarm for 3.15 or 3.20. And I set it on vibrate, not on noise. And the reason why was at 3.15, my hip would vibrate. And now I knew without looking at my watch or looking at another clock that functionally time was up and I would thank that person. So you might want to do a little trick like that as well. Make sure you have ready and plan to ask very productive questions. And so you want to be as effective as possible, get the information you need. 
And also those productive questions, if it shows that you're ready and engaging in the conversation, they'll see you as someone who's an efficient and effective communicator. And that'll shine very well on you as well. So don't take up too much of the person's time and make sure you get information to help your job search. And that's what you do to be effective with informational interview. You'll be probably pleasantly surprised of how open people are to assisting you in this way. So also think about your online presence. And this is uh, the home stretch of uh, this evening's program. The home, uh, online presence is a very important part of um, the uh, hidden job market. And the reason why is as you begin to reach out and connect with people, they're going to check online to validate that they just met you and the information that you said and all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure you do have a reasonably good, well, a good, uh, but a reasonably effective online presence. So it's no longer the case that you may be the primary point of contact between you and the employers. So a lot of times they're going to be looking for people like you. So it's the responsibility, it's your responsibility and your website, your social media, and your online platforms really need to be able to project you professionally. So you'll want to make sure that you are doing and using social media effectively. It helps people learn more about you so that you had that 15 minute informational interview. It's terrific. It's a great start. But now they may uh, look for you on Google. They may look for you on LinkedIn. They may look for you on Facebook and other sites. And you want to have a presence that's consistent among those sites and paints you in as best color as possible. It's also reinforcement. If they just met you and talked to you and then they find information about you that's really the same information, it's validated. It's very powerful. Okay. So ways to be online, certainly consider building a website or having a website built for you. The reason why is think about how Google is used. You put in a search term and a whole list comes up. Well, that whole list are websites. So if you can be found with your own website, that becomes powerful, especially if you're an IT person, even if you're not a website builder, but if you're a programmer or a network manager or an IT project manager, if you know IT, you should have a professional presence through a website. Keep your LinkedIn profile current and relevant. Put a lot of information. LinkedIn can be very robust, a lot more robust than your uh, resume can be. You put a lot of information that's there. And other social media sites as well. Facebook is the largest uh, social media platform. You have to see what your platforms your industry uses. If Facebook is not used by your industry so much, there may be other platforms as well that are relevant. Um, so you want to be where your industry is. Oh, so here we are at the end of our program. So as we sum up, so hidden jobs are filled without an employer posting them. So they're kind of hidden. They're not publicly posted. And as per the Forbes magazine article, up to 70% of open and available jobs are not even posted. That's a lot of jobs. So if you are only searching online in the uh, advertised job market, you're spending 100% of your time. At best, there's only a 30% return. You need to get a much higher return rate. You need to see more positions. Hiring managers prefer to hire people they know. So if you can get to know more people, you might be someone in the back of that hiring manager's mind who will be willing to contact you when there's an open position. So most hidden jobs really are not well hidden. If you can grow your network a little bit and with anybody, just anybody, you never know where your, where your next connection to your next job is going to be. Get those informational interviews and try and connect and meet people and begin to get to know them. More importantly, get allow them to get to know you and develop and grow your online presence. So that is our program. If you want to know where the slide deck is, it's right here. This is my website, princetontechadvisors.com. If you want, I'll put it in chat in a few minutes. So click on the workshops tab on top and then click on the link recently offered programs at the bottom. And then a whole list of my programs from this year will be there. You'll be able to click to get to the slide deck. 
And by tomorrow, you will also be able to click to view this video, which will be actually on YouTube, but you'll be able to see the video as well. So you can come back and uh, watch it again if you'd like or refer it to others. So PrincetonTechAdvisors.com, then click on Workshops and Recently Offered Programs. So that is where our slide deck is. And so any more questions? David, uh, I have to go a little bit early tonight, so I'm about to back out in a minute, but I want to say thank you for this whole presentation. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. Here's my contact information, so if that's helpful to you as well, you're welcome to reach out to me. Thank you, David. I have it from the last session, too. Oh, okay. That's true. Yeah. Thank you again. I'll see you. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. Okay. So I'm also just putting the link in chat, so if you want to copy and paste it. It's there. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns, curiosities? Challenges in your own job search? Maybe we can talk through. I, this is Deb David. I just want to thank you. No one has ever explained networking that way. I wish they had sooner. <laughs> It's a good way to look at it. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad you're uh, finding this helpful. And um, you know what you may also want to do, any of you who are on the call, uh, visit the PSG of Mercer County. It, it's a job seeker support group. Each week we have a topical presentation. And so this week, tomorrow morning, is about LinkedIn and using LinkedIn effectively. But um, we have programs, our calendar is booked into August. So each Friday is a different topical program. And you may find there's another topic of interest that you weren't aware of being offered anywhere. And you'll make sure that you'll want to go uh, see that program and hear that presenter. You don't have to come to PSG or any group every week, but there may be some topics that you just won't want to miss. And those groups are free. Thank you, Dave. It's good You're seeing welcome. you again. Yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Linda, um, yeah, thank you I'm much. going to look into the uh, the job seekers and all that. Okay. Yes. Yep. There's a group that meets on Thursday, I'm sorry, on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 called New Jersey Job Seekers. They're the oldest continuously run group. And, but instead of having a big group with a presentation, they tend to be a small group. And the topics that they talk about are whatever you want to talk about. So that's kind of a little different. So if you know you've got an interview coming up at the end of the week, show up on Tuesday evening and um, you can uh, ask in the group, hey, I've got an interview. I've got this concern. Let's talk through it. And we all talk through it together. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, PSG of Mercer County also has uh, a resources page on the website. And if you click on that, there's links to lots of other job seeker support groups there as well. So if that's helpful, I hope that is. You're welcome to it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other thoughts or questions, concerns? Well, you got me. Going once. Going twice. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for participating and joining this evening. And it was my pleasure to meet you. And I'm glad that you were able to find this program at the Princeton Adult School. And of course, if you know the Princeton Adult School, I'm sure you'll find other programs that you'll find useful and helpful for yourself. And I guess until we meet, hopefully the next time, uh, I'll just simply say thank you very much and do have a good evening.